Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Consulting with Authority. This is your host, Scott Cantrell, joined by a good friend and mentor of mine uh, who I am really, really thrilled to uh, have on the podcast today, Henry DeVries. This is actually Henry's second um, appearance on the podcast. We did an interview uh, a while back, and he was one of the first episodes, so so glad to have him back. For those of you who don't know, Henry is a weekly columnist uh, on business development for Forbes.com. He is the host of the Marketing with a Book podcast and the CEO of Indie Books International. Henry, thank you so much for carving out some time and joining us again today. Scott, thank you so much for asking. I'm always excited to talk to consultants and help them attract high paying clients. Excellent. Well, that is music to all the listeners' ears. So uh, if they weren't sure if they were going to stay tuned in now after that, I know that they will. Um, I want to start by just having you briefly talk about your background um, and share a little bit of how you got to where you are now as a podcast host, a columnist of Forbes, and of course, uh, your primary role as CEO of Indie Books International. What, What was the trajectory of your career like? I come out of consulting. I was the president of an at age 500 advertising and PR firm. So we were 498 and I didn't own the firm. So my job was not to slip out of the 500. So uh, (laughs) I took it seriously. I helped them double revenues uh, from five to 10 million in a few years when I, I came on board and then have worked corporate in marketing and public relations um, for a $5 billion financial services firm. So I've uh, had a number of consultants. I've been in education as a uh, assistant dean for continuing education at the University of California, San Diego, and then developed this ghostwriting business. Um, I got a phone call one day, Scott, the mm-hmm. person says, is this Henry DeVries? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, yeah, speaking. And he goes, Henry DeVries, the ghostwriter? And I said, well, yes. And he says, okay, my story takes place in a mansion on a stormy Halloween night. Inside the mansion, a seance is being held to talk to the soul of the former owner. And I said, I've got to stop you right there. I'm not that kind of ghostwriter. I'm a business book ghostwriter. In the last 10 years, Scott, in fact, I have been the ghostwriter, uh, co-author, editor of more than 300 nonfiction business books, including my international bestseller, How to Close a Deal Like Warren Buffett, now in Chinese. So (laughs) uh, I know my way around uh, the writing world and people kept finding me. Um, And then Eight years ago, I went to the uh, dean at the university and I said, I love what we're doing, you know, love everything here. But for some reason, I love these consultants more and I need to retire from the university and I'm going to devote the rest of my career to helping consultants tell their stories in print. Yeah. And that's what I did. And I help prepare books, publish books and promote books for consultants who want to attract high paying clients. Yeah, that that is phenomenal. And just for everyone listening, full transparency, full disclosure, uh, I'm thrilled to be working with Indie Books International on my upcoming book uh, as well. So um, a big shout out to you, Henry, for your guidance and mentorship on that, as well as the whole team there. Um, It's really fantastic work that you do. I'm a little bit partial um, because we are friends, but we became friends because of who you are and your expertise and uh, and the work that you do. That's how we met. Talk to everybody a little bit about, uh, I kind of want to veer off a little bit just for a second. Sure. And I'd love for you to talk to the audience about the power of story. You know, in our, in our marketplace, in our world right now, um, there's so much competition and so much clutter and so much noise when it comes to a marketing and sales message. And one of the things that I think you do as well as anybody that I know is, is tell, tell a compelling story that illustrates a key point or concept that leads uh, a friend, a colleague, a prospect, a client to a place that you want them to go, but they come to that own realization because they're hearing you tell a story. So any insight that you might have on how a consultant or someone in that world might be able to 
improve their storytelling or leverage storytelling to do their job better or potentially attract new uh, business opportunities. Scott, we live in very emotional times. And if we want to get better at business development, we need to develop the craft of storytelling with a purpose. Mm. So let's go back in time. The year is 2015. The place is Los Angeles, California. We're in a, a high rise building. We're on one of the top floors. I've just presented my Persuade with a Story workshop to a group of CEOs. And the host of the meeting, who was the managing partner of this big law firm, mm -hmm. asked me to come back into his office, his inner office, the inner sanctum office. And the office was filled with old time movie memorabilia and posters. Wow. And uh, this managing partner, we'll call him Bernie, the attorney. So Bernie <laughs> says, um, he goes, uh, yeah, grandpa was a famous Hollywood producer in the 20s and 30s. And dad was a famous Hollywood producer in the 40s and 50s. I went into entertainment law. Mm. But you solved a mystery for me today, Henry. Um, Grandpa used to say, well, you know, we only make eight movies in Hollywood. And I never knew what he meant until your workshop today. Hmm. That's because I told them that human brains are hardwired for stories. And there are eight stories that humans want and need to hear. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, they're the overcoming the monster story, the underdog Cinderella story, uh, the comedy solution to a problem the tragic solution to a problem, uh, the mystery, the quest, uh, the comeback, redemption, rebirth story, and then finally the escape from crazy town story. Mm. And these stories humans are hardwired for, and you can tell them very easily. You can gain a tremendous amount of credibility with a prospect by telling a story in under two minutes that has three characters, um, the main character, who that they would identify with, a nemesis problem, doesn't have to be a person, mm. could be the, could be Obamacare, could be COVID, uh, could be the, um, you know, uh, uh, um, the, re the recession of 2008, just some problem. And then you're the mentor character. You're the Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're the, you're the Yoda character in the story that gives them your wisdom and experience and they win because they followed your advice. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell people all the time that your stories matter. Right. Your stories of how you took a client from mess to success is proof that you're the person for the job, that they can trust you with their problem because you're not a wannabe or a poser. You're not somebody who says, trust me, or I've been doing this for 20 years. You're somebody who can give them a concrete story that takes them from mess to success. So if you want people to think it over, give them lots of facts and figures. They'll think it over forever. Yeah. If you want, well, neuroscience has proved that decisions are not made on the logical argument. They're made on the emotional side. And how do you reach the emotional part of the brain? With yeah. your stories. That's why I say your stories matter. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important because I am... And I've found this uh, in my career. I have to be very intentional. And I suspect there are other folks out there like me who we err on the side of facts, data, logic, and making making a quote unquote argument for whatever it is that we are trying to sell or persuade someone to do or influence them to to believe. And um I I will always err on the logic side of that argument, thinking, oh, well, if they just believe this argument then they have to, if they believe X, then they must believe Y. And of course, the reality in the real world, that's not the case. It's not, it's not even true for me, right? I'm also an emotional buyer, even though I think when I'm selling, I should be a logician. Um, and so I've had to be very intentional with thinking through, okay, if I want them to believe X, Y, or Z, then the best way for me to do that is to tap into the emotion of that. And that the best way to create that emotional experience, and I learned that from you, frankly, Henry, is to tell a relevant story, a story, like you said, that they can resonate with, 
that they can identify with in terms of their own life experience or their business experience. And so now I always think about it as if I'm trying to answer a question for a prospect or a client, if I'm trying to influence them or persuade them in some way, the question that I have is, okay, which story in my story bank, which is something that I have now because of you technique that, and maybe we can talk about that in a second, but a technique that you taught me to do, I think back in my story bank, which is ever expanding. And I say, okay, this is the story that fulfills that question, or this is the story that will help them see the light about this objection or this challenge. I tell the story and then I can always support it logically, right? I support the emotional decision with logic. So they don't just feel good about it, but they, they can, they can prove it to themselves mentally if they need to. Um, and I, it's not a way that I had really intentionally conducted business before. And so now uh, it is something that I, that I try to do in almost every conversation, and I'm not perfect at it, but it's something that has improved my ability to communicate in a meaningful way with a group or a prospect or a client in, in any situation is, is the first question I ask is, what story works here? What story makes sense to tell here? And um, as opposed to saying, how do I get them to believe X, Y, Z, what data points do I give them? And it's that's the that's a second or third or fourth level question. The first question is what story or stories can I share that again that they can identify with? Um, maybe talk a little bit about the story catalog or the story bank, the story inventory uh, technique, if you don't mind sharing that. Absolutely. So first, when you meet with a client, you don't start with a story. I don't want you to be grandpa. You know, you're not Mark Twain on the porch. Uh, it's not about that. It's first you gain the greatest amount of your credibility. And this is through research that we have done for years. You gain your greatest amount of credibility by the quality of questions you ask mm. during that meaningful conversation with a prospect. So you need to ask them about their goals and what do they want to achieve? And you need to ask them about what have they done so far? I, I call it their assets um, and give them credit for what they've done. Then ask them about their roadblocks and be very quiet after you ask that because they know their roadblocks very well and they're happy to tell you. And it usually has to do with time, money and knowledge. Now, then you say, would you like to know how someone else has gotten from where you are to where you want to go. Mm. Everyone says yes. And then you start with one of the stories in your story bank. Um, mm. The year was 2015, the place Memphis, Tennessee. Penny Reed was at her kitchen table in her 800 square foot apartment. She's at her kitchen table with a stack of unpaid bills. She has no idea how she's going to pay these bills. Mm. It was a far cry from the 4,000 square foot home she used to share with her ex-husband, who was her employer, who gave her all her client work. Hmm. Penny Reed's a special woman. I hope you get to meet her someday because she said, well, if you're gonna dream, let's dream big. In two years, I'm gonna be making $200,000 as a speaker and an author. And that's when I met Penny Reed. Hmm. Okay, that's the start of one of my stories. Yeah. And the, the, the finish line is she's now making 280000 a year, <laughs> and she did it in two years. I have another person who uh, wanted to be nationally famous, and in two years, that happened, and now he's making $15,000 a speech. Mm -hmm. Okay, you tell a story, but yeah. you have to have a bank of stories to go to. Right. Um, you can't have one story and they have to be told in a certain way. There's certain emotional beats you have to go with. I gave you a, a place and a year. I did a mental picture of meeting Penny beforehand and, and the, what she was up against. Well, and she was the victim of undeserved misfortune. You know, half the country gets divorced. Uh, yeah. And oh, now so that she's wiped out. Uh, but then you liked and rooted for Penny because I told you she was special. And, and she's going to dream big. And so you were going to root for Penny in that story. Right. Uh, I tell another one about Bill Woodich, and I'm using their real names because I got permission from them to tell the story. Mm -hmm. I actually called them up and said, I want to tell this story. May I tell it to you? And so I told it to them. And everybody has a little condition. Well, you can tell that story if you 
tell them that I'm now speaking for 15,000 or <laughs> yeah. that, you, that you mentioned that when we went out to dinner that I picked up the check, you know, not important to me, but for some reason it was important to them that that be in the story. Great. Right. They're, they're more powerful. If you can use a real name of a real person, they're still very powerful. If you can say, um, let me tell you about an attorney. Mm-hmm. Let's call her Mary. Yeah. This is a true story, but names have been changed to protect confidentiality. Mm-hmm. Totally fine, because many of us in consulting, uh, people don't want to right. have it out that they worked with you. Um, nothing wrong with you, but they, you know, um, if you're a family law attorney, not a lot of people want to know that, you know, they had to go through that, or right. you know, a finance, a bankruptcy advisor, for instance. Yeah, well, let me tell you about all my bankruptcy clients. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's like <laughs> that doesn't play. So it works both ways. Yeah, but the story is powerful if you tell it the right way. Yeah, that's very very good. Um, one of the um, notes that I wanted to get back to is just the 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 place and time, and you, you alluded to this, you said, you know, you don't start with a story, you don't be grandpa on the porch, ask the right questions and let the questions indicate what story. And, and I assume through that, through that open evaluative or discovery process with a prospective client, think about this on the business development side of things, that conversation will automatically lend itself to certain stories as long as you are aware, uh, as long as you're paying attention to what those challenges are, what those roadblocks are, or what those goals are, like you said, moving them from point A to point B, as long as you're paying attention and truly listening, uh, then it should become apparent where a story would be most most effective. Going back to the story bank, how would you, because this is one of the things that I I remember thinking this when you were talking about creating a story bank, and then you, you immediately addressed the issue. I wasn't the first one, apparently. But my thought was, well, I don't, I don't know if I have any stories. I don't know if I have many compelling stories. And I don't remember exactly what you said when we were when I was going through that training, but basically it was everybody has compelling stories. So for someone out there who was like me and, and thought to themselves, I don't know what I would talk about. I don't know if I have any interesting life experiences. I haven't climbed Mount Everest, right? You know, we, we always put these crazy standards on ourselves in terms of what story is, is interesting. What would you say to that person who's trying to build out that story bank that they can go to, but are just kind of at a loss on where to begin? I would make a list, just name names of 10 of your famous, or I'm sorry, favorite in client engagements that went well. Okay. And then that's one column. The next column is what was the measurable result that happened? And a lot of times people have a hard time with this, but I said, we'll go interview the clients. So as a result of working with me, what happened? Um, And that's when I went to Penny. She said, well, in two years, I was making $200,000. I said, no way. She said, way. (laughs) I said, well, great. So in the story, I took literary license Because your prospects are not that articulate when you first meet with them. So we take a literary license. Story has to be true. Doesn't have to be 100% factual. So the literary license is I had Penny say, I'm going to make $200,000 a year. The truth is she said to herself, I'm going to be big. I'm going to be very successful. She couldn't articulate it. Right. Um, Understood. I have another one where Bill Woodich um, said he wanted to speak to 10,000 people at a time. Wow. From zero to 10,000 is where he wanted to go. Well, actually, Bill wasn't that articulate when we first met. He was saying, big audiences, large, you know, huge. You know, it was like, okay. Yes. So I figured, what's an arena? You know, I've, I've been in arenas where people speak to 10,000. Okay. Sure. He's talking about an arena speaker. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, in the story, um, what happens is we get him booked on the Steve Harvey show to talk about the book <laughs> that I helped him do. Yeah. And I, I say in the story, no, Bill didn't speak to 10,000 people that day. You know, and I, I would enhance it now. I'd say he spoke to 200 people in the studio audience and 2 million people 
uh, in the yeah. television audience. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. usually yeah. I just say, no, he spoke to 2 million people today. That's the, mm-hmm. that was the average viewership of a Steve Harvey show. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So in storytelling, that's called crossing the visible finish line. So, so there's one story about a man who was about to go bankrupt, but his dream was to own his own 55,000 square foot building for his business. Well, the story talks about how the bankruptcy gets avoided. And at the end, he buys his 55,000 square foot building. Now, you and me and everyone else, we have a different picture in our mind of that 55,000 square foot building, but we have a picture of it. Yeah, right. And that we're telling a movie. We're telling a a mini movie in two minutes or less about this person. Yeah. And they're the hero, the protagonist of the movie. Um, Scott, some of the people I coach, they get hung up. I I don't like to use the word hero because they think they've done something heroic. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I could get hung up and, well, I did something heroic. I helped uh, Penny go from uh, no money and bills to 200,000 a year. No, Penny's the hero of the story. She did what I advised her. I'm the mentor. Yeah. You want to be the mentor character. If you tell it wrong, if you tell the story that you're the hero, you've cast your prospect as a damsel in distress yeah. that needs to be rescued. And let me tell you, that's not good from a business development standpoint. Yeah. Gotta turn people off. See, that's a huge note. And it's a, it's an easy trap to fall into. I, I luckily that was a lesson that I learned early. I don't remember exactly if I got, I don't remember if I got bloody noses from learning that lesson or if I just realized that this is not being this is not compelling but that was a lesson that I learned early on in terms of 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 telling stories even if it wasn't intentional I just might be telling a story oh I did this I did this I did this I helped them do this I did that I I I and it quick I quickly realized that I was not there was not resonance there there was not empathy or resonance between me and the prospect and it, it became clear that it it's not about me at all and that was more of a uh, a personal it was just as much a personal lesson as it was a professional lesson frankly is to put the spotlight on the client and put the spotlight on your past on your prospect and put the spotlight on your past clients and talk about their successes and what they were able to achieve and i am i am merely the Yoda. I'm merely the con. I wouldn't call myself a Yoda, but I'm merely the conduit or the facilitator that gives them the guidance, helps empower them with the tools so that they can achieve that that goal. That's that's all, quote unquote. That's all I do. Um, and and since then, um, the conversations become so much easier when you don't make it about yourself. <laughs> it's so much easier to have a meaningful conversation. Um, so we've talked about the importance of story and developing stories for business development. Um, you know, purposes. I want to continue in that business development vein because it's an area that you have tremendous expertise in. And I want to talk about one of your latest books that just came out recently. It's right over your shoulder, Rainmaker Confidential. Um, It's a fantastic book. Uh, I've read it twice already. I've dog-eared pages and starred things. Um, I'd love for you to talk about you know, kind of how that book came to be, because it wasn't, it wasn't just something that you sat down with a, at a word processor and a blank screen and you just typed out the book. There was a lot of important effort that you and your co-authors put into this book to make it so great. So I'd love for you to talk about that process. And then maybe if you're open to it, share a, a strategy or two from it that you think might be especially helpful for our listeners and viewers. Happy to. So Let's go back to a scary time in history. It's Friday the 13th, Friday, March 13th, 2020. Yep. And the world shuts down. Um, The governor of California orders me out of my office. I I had to keep paying rent, but I could not go to my office. Wow. Yep. And we're in lockdown. And a question hit me. What are the best rainmakers at professional service firms, big consulting firms, what are the best rainmakers going to do? Because their job is to make it rain, to make clients come in and, you know, rain with cash. So what were they going to do? So I did a research study and interviewed over a hundred top rainmakers. And I was asking them, okay, what are you going to quit spending money on? 
Then I asked them, what are you going to spend more money on? Mm -hmm. And networking is gone as a strategy. Yeah. So what's your new go-to strategy to attract clients? And patterns started to emerge. We collected them into, we call them secrets. It's a mystery to people what to do. So of the eight great stories, Rainmaker Confidential is a mystery. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's other people's experience. Mm -hmm. And they it wasn't corporate espionage. They willingly gave up and shared what was working because it isn't the strategies, it's the execution. Yeah. But they gave the strategies willingly. So Mm -hmm. we compiled that into the book. And uh, you know, Scott, I this is my 14th book on business development. Wow. And my books are my children. And like your children, you can't pick a favorite. But also like my children, I expect them to take care of me in my old age. (laughs) Right. And this book is taking care of me in my old age. Good. Uh, good. People want to do workshops. They want me to come in and present. They want me to uh, walk them through the strategies that's out there. So it's been very gratifying. So you asked for one. Sure. Let me give you one. Great. Um, Stephen Wozner is a podcaster Mm -hmm. and Stephen gave me a metaphor for the best strategy you can do. And his metaphor was the Trojan horse strategy. Love it. So the Trojan horse strategy is something I had studied for years, didn't have a name for it. Stephen gave us the name. So if you remember your Greek mythology, Um, And the Trojan War, the Trojan War was because the Trojans kidnapped the queen of Greece and took her prisoner, Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world. So the Greek fleet comes in, the Greeks lay siege on Troy, they can't take Troy. So they pack up all their stuff, they get in the ships and leave, and they leave behind a a giant wooden horse. And it said it was a tribute to the gods of Troy. So I don't know about these Trojans. You know, I was raised by very suspicious parents. (laughs) They said, my dad used to say, the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And Henry, there ain't anything else free in this world. (laughs) (laughs) And just because somebody said it doesn't make it so. So, uh, yeah, they they were raised on the wrong side of the tracks during some tough times. Um, My dad survived Nazi occupation in the Netherlands. Wow. Uh, my mom was the youngest of 12 children uh, raised by a single mother during the Depression. So you might wow. say, you know, yeah. uh, as Zig Ziglar used to say, they demand the bacteria count of the milk of human kindness. <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. But, but these guys from Troy said, well, it's a gift of the God. What do we do? Well, we wheel it into Troy and put it in front of the temple. Yeah. And they go to sleep. And that night, Greek soldiers hiding in the horse opened the gates to Troy. Meanwhile, the fleet had done a U-turn and landed and they overtook Troy. Yeah. Okay. W- what does this mean? The Trojan horse was a gift, a gift that was gladly accepted and brought in. Okay. So I was asked to speak on a podcast recently, and it's for people who approach the CEOs of 200 to $500 million in revenue companies. Mm -hmm. And they said, Henry, how do we make a relationship with these CEOs? And I said, the Trojan horse strategy. Mm -hmm. And here it is. I was raised, this is a carrot. I was raised on a horse ranch in California. And let me tell you, if you want to give a carrot to a horse, you don't take the carrot and go chasing after the horse. (laughs) You want a carrot? You want a carrot? You want a carrot? There are a few abundance mentality horses that might take the carrot, but most are scarcity mentality. They're a little afraid. If you want them to take the carrot, you put it in your hand and you you will wait for the horse to come up, smell it, and take the carrot. Mm -hmm. You don't chase after a CEO of a $200 to $500 million. That's for sure. Yeah. What you do is you offer them a gift and you study what are the biggest problems that these people have that you solve and then 
tell them you're doing a research study on these problems and that you'd like to interview them. And for being interviewed, you will give them first look at the results on how they compare to their competitors when it comes to solving these problems. Mm -hmm. A man named Bob Schur, who is runs a company called the One Page Business Plan, mm -hmm. he was after this type of group and did just that strategy, interviewed over 100 CEOs. So he formed relationships with them. Bob was thinking, and when this book comes out and I get famous from this book, uh, then it'll create some business. No. He landed many accounts when he was doing the interviews right. because he formed relationships and they would ask him questions like, oh, well, based on your research so far, how would you solve this problem in our company? And he got five and six figure contracts to start doing that. Mm -hmm. The book came out, he continued to be successful. You know, it doesn't have to be a book. Obviously, the, the, the really bright people listening are going to go, wait a minute. That was his strategy for Rainmaker Confidential. Right. Excellent. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how we're landing. I had one, just one people, person in the study contact me um, yesterday and said, gee, do you know anybody who could give a workshop at my company and train my people on how to make better presentations and be better at business development? Let me yes, think. I do. Yeah. All right. Right. Yes. <laughs> we call them rainmaker retreats. So this is what you do. But Wozner did it with podcasts, mm -hmm. and he says it's not a one and done. That's not a relationship. Right. A relationship is you keep sending gifts. Oh, here's here's an article I saw you might be interested in. Here's a white paper we did on this. Uh, here's a copy of one of my books on the subject. Just you send things, and. As my mom, the waitress from New York who didn't finish high school used to teach me, give if you want to get. Yeah. Give if you want to get. So Excellent. first you give and you keep giving. Uh, the scripture says one who gives generously will end up with more. Uh, that was wise King Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, he also said the generous person will prosper. So generosity is our brand. And we mm -hmm. advocate generosity as a business development strategy to build relationships. Yeah. Well, and to that end, um, well, I can just affirm that that's not something you just say. That is something that you that you practice and you do walk that talk. And this interview on this podcast today is just an, an, an example of that. You've been incredibly generous with your expertise and your time. And so this Trojan horse strategy, you know, the thing I love about it is the problem that so many of us consultants and the people in our space that we run into is it's not ha it's not cultivating or having building a relationship once we can get in front of the person or once we you know start there yes we have to be intentional with it we do have to follow up we have to cultivate that relationship intentionally over time but where so many people i think initially have trouble is the entry point how do I get the first meeting? How do I get access to that individual? And so what you're describing here with the Trojan horse strategy, whether it be a podcast or I'm writing a book or a research study or whatever, it's something grander where you are asking for someone's help as opposed to saying, hey, can I take 15 minutes and tell you about what I do? Right. And that's a it's a huge it's a seismic shift. It is about being generous first, as opposed to it's about being altruistic in the sense of asking for help. Well, can you help me with this? Well, are you willing to answer this question for me or with me? Are you willing to do this interview? You know, and that's a lot easier thing for someone like that, the 200 to $500 million CEO, it's a lot easier for them to say yes to that, as opposed to, am I just going to give you 20 minutes for your sales pitch? No, I'm not going to do that, but I'm happy to help because so many of those individuals at that level, regardless of what level you're talking about, so many leaders are willing to share their expertise and their knowledge because that's how they got to where they are. They had someone help them. And so I think going at it from that standpoint and just, and, and obviously it is about being authentic and transparent. If you're doing a research study, do the research study, right? <laughs> if you're writing the book, write the book. Uh, if you're doing a podcast, you know, do, if you're asking for a podcast interview, you know, you should be doing a podcast. Um, that's a given. But I think it's 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 a fantastic way to get entry into into those conversations and then just cultivate them over time. Um, I will be fully transparent. 
this podcast, I've used the Trojan horse strategy to talk to people that I would have never easily been able to get access to or in touch with or have a meaningful conversation with, save for the fact that this podcast exists and that I was able to interview them. And several of them have, you know, I'm in business relationships with many of those people that I first met just to talk about the prospect of them being on the podcast. And that's all due to this same strategy that you're that you're talking about. So I will absolutely affirm and endorse it. It does absolutely work. Um, for we're coming up on time, Henry. But for those folks who are interested in learning more about your work, maybe give a, a, a general overview about the type of work that Indie Books International does. Um, because I know there's a lot of people who are listening or viewing this that that would certainly likely benefit from the work that you do. Thank you. People work with us because they want more credibility, more impact, more influence, and ultimately more clients. And we help them in three ways. We help them prepare a manuscript to be published. We help them publish their manuscript. And we help them promote their book by teaching them how to market with a book and a speech to attract high-paying clients. And those are separate. Some people use this for all three. Amazingly, I thought I did a bad job when I created this business. It's a labor of love. But I wanted to help consultants, but I thought, well, I'll help one consultant and then I'll have to keep finding new consultants. Well, actually, after eight years of doing this, 75% of our clients are from referrals from clients. Yeah. And we get people who are doing their second, third, fourth book with us because they realize the strategy of the new book and, and the Trojan horse of talking to people, then talking about the book, then actually talking about the next book has produced, some people are on record that we've helped them earn more than a million dollars from this strategy. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're on record for that. So it's those three things. Um, I'll either be a developmental editor to coach them along. Um, if you're the CEO of some company, you should not be spending your time writing a book. You need to hire someone like me, who's your tool. That's when one CEO said, I don't know if this is right, Henry. And I said, Buck, uh, what do you mean? He goes, well, uh, my name is on it, but really, you know, you interviewed me and you wrote the words. Uh, and I said, oh, well, uh, he was a home builder. I said, Buck, how many yeah. homes are you going to build this year? And he said, a thousand. I said, oh, your arms are going to be really tired from all that hammering and painting. <laughs> I said, Don't be silly. You know, I cause a thousand homes. I said, oh, like you caused this book to come. You just used a mm -hmm. tool. So just think of me as your tool. So I'm the CEO's tool to get a book done. <laughs> so that's the preparation. Uh, publishing, we have different ranges on how we can help people publish. Mm -hmm. And then promoting, uh, we've just added a new division because we listen to our clients. One, actually, a group of our authors met, I mean, without me, elected a spokesperson, and the spokesperson had a, a, to, asked for a meeting and, and representing them said, we need you to not send us to other people to promote the book. We need you to offer that service. We wow. trust you to offer that service. Wow. So now we have a whole promotion division and we're even promoting books that we didn't prepare and publish. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't take everybody on, Scott. Sure. Um, actually, uh, only one in four people who ask for our help, we actually agree to do it. Mm -hmm. Understood. We have standards. Yeah, that, you, you certainly do. Um, and the people that you work with, it's a it's a rarefied group, um, and I'm I'm happy to be counted amongst them. Uh, if someone wants to learn more about Indie Books International, if they want to get a copy of Rainmaker Confidential or any of your other books, uh, I've got a bunch of them. By the way, are on the shelf behind me. Uh, Marketing with a book uh, and speech is a fantastic uh, book. Persuade with a story, fantastic book, and many others. Uh, I can't recommend them enough. But if if someone wants to learn about your work, Henry potentially reach out to you or learn more about Indie Books International and how they might engage, what's the best next step for them to do? Where can they go? Okay. And, and uh, okay, if I offer them some gifts? Uh, I'll, I'll, we will never turn those down. So long as there's not an army waiting in the belly of the gift, it's fine. Right. But right. Uh, and there your, is your gifts are very generous and authentic. So I think we're safe. Yeah. Yeah. Call it karma, call it kismet, call it 
the law of reciprocation, call it what you will. Um, it's just, or call it the scripture, uh, the generous person will prosper. So that's, that's the, there is, the trick is there's no trick. Exactly okay. right. Yep. So I send out a weekly uh, tip on business development. It takes less than two minutes to read. You can go on my website, uh, www in the I-N-D-I-E books, B-O-O-K-S-I-N-T-L.com, IndieBooksInternational.com, and uh, sign up for the weekly tips. We don't spam you. Uh, we don't sell a list. You can get off the list whenever you want. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get on there and, and get the tips for free. Um, if you send me an email at henry at IndieBooksInternational.com, and mention Scott's name, you can get one of two things. Uh, one, um, just tell me what the problem is and I'll send you one of my books, no cost. Wow. Wow. Get $20 book at no cost. Um, second, if you want a strategy call and you mention Scott's name, I'll give you a 45 minute no selling zone strategy call. I'll help you get clarity around your goals your assets, your roadblocks, and how other people have used you to get from point A to point B. That's fantastic. Happy to do that. That's One true. more gift. Oh, I'm, you're not? Okay. <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> okay. I, I, yeah. If you send me an email and the subject line is Forbes, that's all you need to do. Send mm -hmm. the email, subject line Forbes. I will send you instructions on how you can pitch me on a Forbes.com column on your expertise. Wow. So I have it all spelled out. And uh, I do five of these a month, you know, so 60 a year. So there's always another one coming along and I'm always looking for good ideas. And regularly I form relationships with people this way and uh, would love to do it. Oh, is he trying to form a relationship with me? <laughs> that I am. <laughs> and I'll keep giving you things uh, until you tell me to stop. Uh, it's just the, the more generous I am, the luckier I get. Yeah. And the more the business grows. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely phenomenal. And to use to, to use the word again, incredibly generous. Uh, and I can just affirm for everyone out there listening, having known Henry now for a little over two years, I think. Yeah. We yeah. met a little over two years ago. Um, uh, th this is the real guy. He is authentic as he seems. Uh, this is who he is. This is the, the, he absolutely practices what he preaches and it's uh it's been an honor to, to work with you, Henry. And I certainly appreciate your being willing to share those resources um, with everybody who's listening and watching today. And I would absolutely encourage everyone to take Henry up on, on the generous offer. Um, Henry, I uh, want to end with one final question. Okay. Um, this is a broad question. Answer it or interpret it however you care to. Uh, personally, professionally, lessons learned that you would like to impart to listeners and viewers today. If you could impart one or two personal or professional lessons learned that might be beneficial for us to hear uh, in today's world. Thank you. Great question. So one lesson is, and I didn't learn it till I was in my 40s, was determine if somebody is worthy of your talents. Hmm. Don't work for just anybody. One lawyer I interviewed, Scott, I asked him what kind of law he practiced. He said, I practice rent law. Any law that pays the rent, that's the law I'm going to practice. <laughs> yeah. So yes, it's find your specialization, find your niche, your niche, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, that's all too. But also just don't work with anybody. Yeah. Um, and I have stories if you want stories, but that's just one lesson learned. Fantastic. Um, the other one we've talked about uh, generosity being mm -hmm. of course. the secret. Yeah. Uh, the secret uh, the, the people's are, people are always looking for the silver bullet, you know, the magic, do this, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the magic, um, being a magician yourself. Um, but, but 
And like, because they want a trick, there is no trick. Right. One is you have to be really good at what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, just whatever it is. And I read a great book this year um, about uh, business secrets from the Bible. And I know we all have different faiths and I respect that, but this was by a a Jewish rabbi Mm -hmm. and he was taking business lessons out of the uh, Hebrew scriptures, the old Mm -hmm. Testament, if you will. Sure. And he made the argument that God wants several things from us. One, that we're all in business. And that two, God wants you to specialize. <laughs> a specialist in something. Yeah. And three, use that specialization to help God's other children. Mm-hmm. And the more of God's other children you can help, the better it'll be for you. Yep. And that actually helping other people. And that's what I love about consultants. When I talk to consultants, it's never about making more money. Mm-hmm. And that's not what drives them. Right. What drives them is having more impact and influence. I right. just say that's another way of helping more of God's other children. Absolutely. And with their specialization. So that's the lesson I'd like to leave with you. That's fantastic. Um, Henry, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for being willing to carve out some time and invest it today. I've got three pages of notes uh, full up with stars and lines drawn everywhere. So thank you again for uh, your continued mentorship to me and the work that we're doing together. And uh, just on behalf of all the listeners and viewers, I appreciate your time and expertise today. Thank you so much for having me. It's, It's always great to help God's other consultants. (laughs) consultants. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Excellent. Well, with that, we'll close out this episode of Consulting with Authority. As always, I wish you all the best of success. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor of our show, Smart Solutions Media. Smart Solutions Media empowers business owners, consultants, and other independent professionals to easily attract better prospects, and transform them into long-term clients. If you're a B2B consultant or service professional and would like to start filling your pipeline with better quality prospects, visit us on the web at smartsolutionsmedia.com to learn more about what we can do to help you. Be sure to complete this short two-minute accelerated growth scorecard you can find on the website and you'll receive a complimentary strategy session where we'll give you specific insights and recommendations to help you attract high-value clients. Until next time, Make sure you are consulting with authority.